Hello. Good morning or good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us. I'd just like to thank you all for uh, joining our uh, talk today. Uh, we're going to cover a number of topics uh, related to uh, improving the uh, uh, UV curing process and offering the highest quality process. Uh, it's a topic I'm very passionate about. I've spent uh, the last 13 years uh, in this industry and uh, providing a lot of uh, insight to uh, medical device manufacturers and precision optoelectronic uh, manufacturers on how to best implement uh, this great technology. So there's a number of things I wanted to cover. I uh, just kind of set back the basics a little bit. I think it's important to talk about is some of the fundamentals of light cure technology. Uh, followed by how closed-loop feedback technology can enable lean manufacturing and medical device manufacturing. I'm going to share with you a cost savings model and then speak a little bit about future technology advances in the light curing market. Light cure adhesive cure when exposed to visible light. So this, uh, this technology enables uh, materials to be cured when it's exposed to the right wavelengths of light. Uh, the wavelength of light that we're most commonly talking about is in the UV invisible spectrum. Those wavelengths range from around 250 nanometers up to around 500 nanometers of light. Uh, you'll see there's different bands of UV within that, in UVC, UVB, UVA. Typically, uh, the medical device manufacturing adhesives include uh, uh, multiple photo initiators, ones that cure in the visible light for deeper penetration of cure, uh, as well as um, uh, sort of initiators that are in the UVB and UVC range, and the reason they include those is, is better surface cure uh, when reduces the amount of tackiness that might be found on adhesive that may be uh, exposed to uh, exposed to the uh, elements. So the science behind the light curing adhesives, essentially, there's a photo initiator that's in the material uh, that, once triggered by the right amount of intensity. Uh, or a radiance from the light source at the right uh, wavelength, the photon initiator breaks down and creates a, uh, a, a new, um, a new uh, uh, accelerator that enables the material to, uh, to begin to cure. Um, it, in most commonly, the curing begins and stops with light exposure. So most of these materials are, uh, when they're exposed to light, uh, the curing is, is going on. As soon as the light is removed, the curing uh, stops. So it's important that you do get full cure when you're uh, in full cross-taking of these chemistries once you've uh, once you've uh, uh, once you're finished with the, the light exposure for them. So some of the benefits of UV cure uh, is instant. So UV cure materials cure within seconds, uh, and that ranges anywhere from you know two or three seconds for some materials and some applications to uh, you know as many as many as ten seconds commonly. Uh, a lot of that depends on how close that you can get the light source to the adhesive or what you're curing through. If you're curing through materials that, that block some of the transmission of light, obviously that, that dose, uh, that cure time can take uh, longer. One of the great benefits is, of this is that you have very, very short cycle time. So you, uh, you're, you're able to produce parts in a, in a, in a very fast fashion. Also, cure on demand. One of the nice things with this technology is in medical you find a wide range of applications, whether uh, it be manual uh, assembly of, uh, of uh, medical devices or fully automated production lines. The nice thing with this is that this, these materials will not cure uh, until they're exposed to that right wavelength and the right intensity of light, which gives you time to work with the material and get things set properly before you actually cure the material, which is, which is critical. Um, ease of automation, because this is, uh, is relatively easy to automate and it is very fast, uh, it enables you, uh, it, it, it runs very well to, uh, to fast-paced automation, similar with that you might find in, uh, in uh, needle uh, cannula manufacturing. For economical, uh, you can see typically 30% for some traditional assembly costs. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the presentation of where some of these cost savings come from. But there's a number of areas that uh, that, that uh, can save a lot of uh, uh, save a lot of uh, time uh, and resources with this technology. One of the nice things is there's a wide selection of of, uh, of uncured viscosities and cured physical characteristics. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but one of the things here is that you can, for almost any application, uh, as long as you can get light to that, there's a, a wide variety of materials over there. There's probably, uh, you know, there's probably in the range of thousands of uh, thousand materials that are out there to uh, to be cured from different uh, uh, different uh, uh, suppliers. It's also environmentally sustainable because there is no solvents when the material is uh, cured. So 
it's uh, it, you know, it's, it's a lot friendlier, environmentally friendly for uh, for um, our op- operators to work with because there is not a lot of solvent smell and there's nothing being released to the of the air that, that affects negatively affects the uh, the production environment, which is great. And they have uh, the medical device uh, materials that are designed specifically for these applications are biocompatible. So for devices that are going to be invasive, uh, the technology works very, very well. So main manufacturing, uh, the definition uh, is, uh, main, definition, uh, main manufacturing definition is a production practice that considers the expenditure of resources for any goal other than creation of value for the entity wasteful, and that's the target for elimination. So today we're going to focus a little bit on, on some of the things that, that are given with UV light technology, and, uh, and also some of the things that because of those things you might have to do in a production process, which could be viewed as wasteful processes. So hopefully we're going to uh, impart some ideas today that are going to enable you to maybe reduce or eliminate some of these processes from uh, from your production environments by using some of the available technology that's on the marketplace today. So reality is with lead sources, they degrade over time. And this is a given. So, uh, you know, as the, the land degrades, the amount of intensity available is decreasing. Uh, this will have a negative effect on material material because ultimately your dose that you're delivering is changing over time. The dose is very important to cure material, and the dose is actually a function of the intensity and the time. So uh, if, if, if your intensity is decreasing or changing, uh, that is obviously going to affect the, uh, the, uh, uh, the recipe that you're delivering to the adhesive. Which creates, and then with that, it creates some process variation, which is which is not good in a, in a production environment, especially in medical device manufacturing, where curing uh, curing consistency and repeatability is extremely important. So, where where what happens is a lot of uh, a lot of work has to go in to try and monitor and maintain this. So, there's ongoing surveillance that goes on. There's regular adjustments to some curing systems that give you the ability to make those adjustments. There's uh, additional operator training because operators have to know uh, what they should be looking for from reading an uh, intensity and how to set the system, which all leads to uh, increased labor. Uh, there's additional QA steps involved because if you're not entirely confident on how light that's been delivered to each and every part, then uh, there should be additional QA steps that are required. Uh, there's increased scrap because if you're producing parts that don't have a consistent cure and you test them further down the line with further value-added parts, that also can, uh, can increase your scrap cost. And really, it all comes down to more manual intervention in the process. And when we go back to the lean manufacturing definition, these, some of these things could be viewed as, a, as additional or excessive costs when they could be removed out of a process. So just uh, an example of what happens to a UV lamp over time, they degrade. So on the, uh, the one axis, you have the intensity, which is typically in milliwatts per centimeter squared or watts per centimeter squared, uh, and then you have your hours of operation. Um, most UV lamps today will last you approximately 2,000 to 3,000 hours of usable life. When we say usable life, we rate that typically in the industry to be about 50% of your initial output. And one rule of thumb that is important to, to try and uh, use is if you're, if you're using a system, you have a brand new lamp, try and set your intensities to 50% or lower. Most modern curing systems today, you have plenty of output available to you. So what this is doing is, is, is giving you the amount of light that's needed, but not an excessive amount, which enables you to maximize your lamp life, which is important in lowering your operating costs. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the advances in technology regarding uh, LED technology as well. Um, is, uh, is there's another key uh, key uh, technology that, that is becoming more and more available. So, as you can see, the last degree over time, this is just something that gives you uh, an indication of, of, a, of a typical uh, um, a degradation that can occur with a UV lamp. So, while that lamp is uh, degrading, your process is changing. And most, in most cases, you have a certain threshold that's set for that process. Uh, whether in this particular case, your process is set, let's say, at four watts per centimeter square. So even as your intensity is, is above your four watts per centimeter square with your lamp brand new, as it degrades, your process is changing. So you're delivering more intensity than might be needed for the process, which brings variability in. Once as we're depicting here, as it drops below that threshold level, 
that's when your really the, the bond quality degrades significantly. Because in most times through a DOE, you're going to find out what minimum level of intensity is required at what time to cure your material uh, and uh, and cure uh, your device. Uh, anything below that will obviously compromise the, the quality of the device and the bond could be weak. One of the nice things that closes feedback does is it enables you to set your precise intensity from the get-go with your lens when it's brand new, and then ultimately it automatically maintains that level of intensity through the life of the lens. So as your lens is degrading, the system automatically picks up on that and makes the appropriate adjustments within the system to maintain that same level of intensity. So a couple of benefits. One, you have a, a, a dramatically reduced amount of, uh, of surveillance that's needed because the technology uh, is, is doing this for you. If there's any issues with the amount of intent is delivered, it will actively alarm you to tell you that is the case. Um, but also, it also maintains that there's no process variability. Because as I pointed out earlier, even if your intensity is above the threshold, your four watts per centimeter squared in degrading, and you're not appropriately adjusting the time for that, the dose of light that's being delivered is changing. And ultimately, that will have an effect on the cured properties of the material. Um, just to, to, to talk about some of those cured properties, uh, you know, it's all dependent on the amount of cross-linking cross -linking that is done in the chemistry itself, the adhesive. And a lot of times, the, the tests are relatively crude for, for finding out if the material is uh, cured or not. In many cases, you'll see it's a poke test or, or, a, or a pull test um, to add some uh, objectivity to that. But all of these things, the flexibility material, the, the uh, coefficient thermal extension, the chemical resistance, the moisture resistance, the modulus, the flexibility, the elongation, the strength in the material, are all being affected at the, at the micro level in the chemistry and, and at the molecule level of the chemistry. So if the process is not repeatable, although the material both properties may be cured, there could be changes within each of these uh, in different areas, which could have long-term effects on your device uh, or when the device may be in use. So it's extremely important that that process repeatability is built in uh, to, uh, to ensure that you have a consistent process. So in the system itself, uh, how this particular technology works is you have a lamp uh, burner, which is what provides the light. Uh, it's in most commonly in a factory system, which we're talking about today, is reflectorized. As the light comes through the optical tube, it's highly focused because of the reflector. It goes through a beam splitter. That beam splitter samples a very small portion of the light uh, that is representative of the amount of intensity coming through, uh, and it measures that and compares that to the set level that's made in the system. The remainder of the light uh, enters the light guide, uh, which you can see there with the small dot on it. That is the representative of the light guide itself. So what this intensity monitor is doing is real time. It's measuring the amount of intensity that is coming from that lamp. It is, is uh, taking that energy, comparing it to the benchmark, and then making the appropriate adjustments to an iris that sits in front of that. So there's a, an iris that, uh, that sits just in front of that. You'll see it depicted by the, uh, the gray um, uh, gray uh, um, power that sits in front of that. So what the benefits of this technology that is available, it enables consistent light output guaranteeing process repeatability from, you know, the first device that's made until the system alarms and, and the last device that may be made uh, prior to having to change the lamp out. That automatically uh, compensates for that, that lamp degradation that's given in all lamps. Uh, it increases yield and the quality of assembly because you do have that repeatable process. You have minimized labor because you don't have to do as much surveillance, and that also includes the amount of quality steps that might have to be added to ensure that, that if you're not having a consistent cure that you're getting the same results. Uh, eliminates the chance of operator error. If your operator is evaluating that uh, amount of intensity and having to make the adjustments to the system, that's a manual operation, and there could be mistakes made with that. Uh, and um, also, it, uh, it, uh, it, the, the system itself maintains it's plus or minus 5% in the process setting. And you can also use the length of the, uh, you can use the full length of the lamp and you set up your process and this system will automatically maintain an alarm to tell you when that's changed up. So really what this does, you, it enables you to sleep at night and, and really gives you the ability not to, to, to lose sleep over your process when you're not there over there monitoring it because the system is doing that uh, for you. Uh, it's built in, uh, into the technology, into the system itself. So what I wanted to do is run a little uh, uh, calculation um, 
uh, just to show you some of the potential savings that you uh, that you can have with uh, the calculator. Uh, the calculator here, what it what it does is, is compares um, uh, an S two thousand system with a standard system uh, that would have a manual adjustment. Um, and in that particular system, what we're saying is that the system will maintain that output within plus or minus um, plus or minus five percent uh, for one hundred and twelve hours. The system will maintain that output. So, if we do uh, uh, a normal uh, operation. Normally, it's about once, at, at minimum, once a shift, the, uh, the uh, technician would have a look uh, at the intensity of available. It, it could be more frequently. I've seen it uh, uh, done every couple of hours or sometimes every, every four hours. It all depends on the frequency. That I think is as an average. Uh, the number of shifts per week. So uh, if you look at the number of, sh uh, the number of uh, shifts that are done per week, we would have, let's say we're running uh, uh, two shifts uh, here. And sorry, put that in. And sorry, I'm going to make an adjustment. I filled in the wrong area. And uh, also the uh, number of unit sharing systems that are operating. So anytime you know these these can these can vary on a production line anywhere from 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 one or two systems all the way up to 50, 60, 70 systems on there. So I'm going to use 20 systems as as a as a, as a, uh, a system to do. If we go down. As you can see, with a system with closed loop feedback, the, the system would only have to be checked 149 times um, over the life uh, or over the uh, over that year. And um, and with a manual check, you're having to check that system constantly. You'd be looking at 2,080 times. So a lot of labor involved in that and room for error. So if we put in a labor rate here, uh, I'm just going to pick a number and say $20 per hour, a burden labor rate. What you're looking at. Here is is really you know the cost of calibration calibration of the year could be two hundred forty eight dollars on fifteen sorry on twenty systems uh, in and that cost would be three thousand four hundred sixty seven dollars uh, because of that frequent check you're having to constantly monitor that system so here you're looking at a cost savings on this particular example of three thousand two hundred nineteen dollars um, uh, in this particular example. Which is significant when you actually look at as it's just simply talking about the uh, the, ca the calibration costs. Uh, that's 161 hours that your operators or, or technicians would get back uh, with not having to to uh, to make these adjustments. Like I said, the the um, uh, the nice thing is that this technology is available and it's relatively easy to implement uh, to, uh, to 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 generate these cost savings. This uh, cost calculator is available on uh, on the uh, Lumen Dynamics website, uh, as well as a number of other economic cost calculators. So, if if you want to punch your own numbers in it and do some of that evaluation yourself to evaluate uh, what the savings might be in your particular situation, that uh, that calculator is available there, and it's uh, it's fairly simple to uh, to uh, find and to operate. So, once again, to review, you're reducing a lot of surveillance and a lot of monitoring with uh, closed feedback technology. So it's a real ally in, in saving uh, time and money and resources uh, for, a, a, uh, for a medical device manufacturer. So all the, over the, all the costs that we talked about that are directly related to the labor that's spent in, in doing those validations, you're also getting some intangible costs, which would be consistent UV process, very repeatable assembly of process, higher yields because you're doing the exact same thing to every device that's, that's seen, Less downtime because you're not having to, to take those systems offline to make those measurements or do them at the beginning of the shift or end of the shift. Uh, minimize the operator intervention, less room for, for human error, uh, less inline QA testing because you can have the confidence that you're getting the, uh, the output that's, uh, that's been programmed, and a, a simplified process flow. So these are some of the intangible costs that can be added to the addition, uh, to the savings that are, that, are, that are directly related to the labor. <laughs> So, future technology considerations. We talked a lot about lamp-based curing, and um, it has some of its uh, limitations. Uh, there are some advantages to lamp-based uh, because you have very, very high intensity that's available. Excuse me. It's very dry here in the uh, Canadian uh, Canadian winter. So, uh, uh, when you uh, so it's one of the things with lamp-based, you get a broad spectrum of light, which is, which is really important to uh, to note. Um, LED technology is is, um, is entering the market and has been for the last couple of years, 
and the intensity or the amount of irradiance available is increasing over time, which is, which is great, and that is important uh, in order to hit that minimum threshold you need to cure these materials properly and get them cross them. The one challenge is these, these lights are monochromatic, so they're not comparable to lamps because a lot of times they're at 365 nanometers or 400 nanometers, and what that means is it's quite a different type of light that you're delivering to your adhesive, uh, because your current adhesive may be used to a broad spectrum and may absorb light over a broad spectrum. These uh, LEDs may, uh, may, um, may activate one portion of that. Uh, but one, once again, there are things changing there. There are more and more materials entering the marketplace from formulators now that, that are tailored for LED technology, which is, uh, which is helping uh, the, uh, the, uh, the adoption of this particular technology. Uh, cooling efficiency is everything in LED technology. In order to get the long life that's, that's, uh, that's promised from, these, uh, from this technology, you need to effectively cool these masses as well. If you don't, um, they will actually degrade relatively quickly, and, uh, and then they, can be, they actually, the cost savings is, is reduced because they're expensive, because it's not a matter of changing the lamp, it's a matter of changing the entire uh, uh, device itself. So a cooling is everything, so it's important to, to when you're when you're buying these systems just to make sure that they are advanced and they do have the proper cooling that's, that's required. Uh, also, it's a bit of a misconception that LEDs have the have, don't have any degradation. They actually do degrade over time. And I mentioned that cooling can have an effect on the uh, the degradation of those LEDs, but also the how hard you're driving those particular LEDs also have an effect on how they degrade. Now they degrade much much slower than lamps. Uh, uh, for sure, but it is something that needs to be taken into consideration that you that you do need to be able to to measure the amount of light that comes out of these because they will change over time and you may have to make adjustments. Uh, I'll be on much much um, uh, longer uh, periods, but it is something that should be uh, should be uh, known. And there's not a lot there's not a lot uh, of information out there currently uh, regarding this. Also. One of the challenges is the, the lack of, of uh, available narrow band measurement tools available. A lot of times you'll see these with respect for broad band lamps. Uh, the formulators on the technical data sheets call for it, it's traditionally from a broad band lamp uh, that's been used in, in, a, in, a, in a radio on which measurement appropriately. Now you need to change the actual measurement device as well, and, and these devices are a lot more challenging to measure repeatedly and to be mistraceable. So that is another thing we need to be taking into consideration, specifically in medical device manufacturing, with the regulatory um, uh, concerns that are there. You have to have a process that, that is able to be measured and validated. And this is one of the one of the current challenges that is uh, that is exist with LED technology. So. Uh, look, at this. it's a wonderful technology. It offers many, many benefits. Uh, very long lamp, uh, very long life. Um, it's uh, in a lot of times where these systems are relatively compact. They're um, uh, something very easy to implement. But you need to you need to, to know what you're facing here, so you can do the appropriate testing. Uh, it, it's not a plug and play solution. But if you if you do that testing, find that there is a good fit between that. There, there's it is a, it's a wonderful technology, and one that I, I'm sure we'll, we'll we'll see more and more adoption as we move forward. Well, I'd just like to thank you all for uh, for uh, attending uh, this uh, this uh, webinar, and uh, I think uh, at this point, Ms. Allen's going to open this up to some Q&A, and be more than happy to answer any questions that uh, that, uh, that might come up. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, appreciate the uh, very informative and thoughtful uh, presentation. Uh, we only have time for a couple questions here, so uh, we do appreciate your uh, your questions. And what we're going to do is we selected two questions from the uh, from the uh, from the number of questions that we received. And uh, as a follow-up, what we're going to do, we, uh, we're going to compile all the questions and uh, have uh, Jeff uh, provide answers to all these questions and do a follow-up email uh, with the answers to all the questions. So the two questions that we picked up here, uh, question number one, uh, Jeff, how often do you recommend the UV assembly manufacturers to calibrate their spot curing system if they do not have closed feedback technology systems? Well, you know, it's a good question, and uh, and it's one that, that does come up um, uh, does come up time and again. And uh, if you're doing a, if there's a manual UV curing system that, that that is being used, it's also going to depend on the, the degradation of that particular lamp, because all every lamp uh, will degrade uh, differently. Also, even the same lamp modules. A lot of times, these lamp modules are handmade. Uh, um, it's fairly common from the large manufacturers because of the special nature of these particular lamps themselves and the focus that's required. Uh, 
you uh, and, and that will range anywhere from from maybe once every four hours to at, at least I'd say at least once a shift. Once every eight hours, you want to be taking some sort of measurement from these uh, the, the system to make sure it has the right intensity. And if it doesn't have the right intensity, uh, you want to be able to, to make adjustments. So one thing that's important if you're selecting a hearing system, if you want to make sure that you have the ability to adjust that output. If you don't have closed the feedback, at minimum, you want to have the ability to have some control over the amount of light that comes out of that system. It's extremely important because uh, then you can, if, even from, even for that process consistency, then even if you're doing that manually, then you can, you have the ability to do that. But obviously the closing feedback over technology will enable you to do that uh, more automated. Absolutely. And the second and last question here, uh, what kind of applications do you see this type of systems with closing feedback technology uh, would, uh, would probably uh, more need that kind of technology? Well, any time it's, it's very high precision, uh, this requires, we find that the closing feedback, that's, that's where customers seem to be most interested in that technology. Uh, a lot of our customers that, that manufacture catheters uh, um, use the, uh, the, uh, the closing feedback technology that they select. Um, also, you find in highly automated processes, like I mentioned before, like cannula manufacturing or insulin pen manufacturing, where the production rates are very, very high. Uh, the, and there's automation involved. It means that uh, there, that technology is very well implemented. We also see it in, in other industries as well. There's a very, very high interest in it in, uh, in optoelectronics manufacturing, where the uh, people are bonding lenses. There's a high level of precision required. Um, also, in consumer electronics, uh, in whether it be uh, uh, data storage devices or in mobile camera phones or in displays, the, the production rates for these are, are extremely high in, in the millions uh, of, of units being used, and, and it's really important because the cost of quality increases dramatically if, if you're not bonding your parts together appropriately. That's fantastic. Well, we, uh, we reached to the, uh, to the end of our, uh, our webinar. Uh, this is all the time that we have allowed for, uh, we have allowed for this uh, webinar. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Jeff uh, for his uh, participation and his uh, very insightful uh, speech and, and, uh, and answering the questions. I also would like to thank you, the uh, participants, for taking part in this webinar and forwarding your, uh, your questions. Uh, we are recording this webinar and we're going to make this uh, webinar available on our website and also available on YouTube as well. Uh, again, thank you very much for your participation and have a great day.